Can you believe that in all the years I've been making this show, I've never once done a Christmas movie? I mean, it's not like there aren't any Christmas-themed movies I could do. There is. It's just... I don't know, usually I'd rather do something like Star Crash or Wicked City this time of year. Nothing gets you in the holiday spirit quite like cartoon tentacle sex. Well, that changes right now, because this year I am finally doing a Christmas-themed cult movie. So, what, am I gonna rag on some low-hanging fruit like Santa Claus Conquers the Martians or Santa and the Ice Cream Bunny? Nope, I'm doing a legit cult classic that's considered one of the greatest and most influential horror movies ever made. Hey, it's my last video of the year. Might as well go out on a high note. Black Christmas is a 1974 Canadian horror movie that's considered by some people to be the very first example of what was later called the slasher movie genre. But I don't know how that could possibly be, since if you've ever watched a superficial horror documentary, you would know that Halloween was the first slasher movie and that absolutely nothing came before it. Okay, the truth is you can't really point to any one movie as inventing the slasher movie genre. If you've watched this show before, you'd know that early 70s Italian films like Torso and Twitch of the Death Nerve contain many similarities to 80s slasher movies. And you could probably point to some earlier movies like Psycho and Peeping Tom as having elements of the genre. But the point is, Black Christmas cemented many of the tropes and stylistic elements we now associate with slasher movies. It was also one of the first horror movies to center around a holiday other than Halloween, although initially distributors tried releasing it as Silent Night, Evil Night because they thought the title Black Christmas would lead people to believe it was a black exploitation movie. Back in the 70s, any movie with the word black in it was automatically assumed to be a black exploitation film. That's why so many people thought The Black Hole was a hardcore porn starring Pam Greer. I've also got another reason for picking this movie, namely the fact that it was made in my home country. After The Shape of Things to Come, I feel like I need to prove the Canadian film industry is capable of actually making good movies, and not just ones that give Jack Palance a concussion. So the movie's brought to us by Film Funding, giving money to movies for as long as Canada's had a tax incentive for that kind of thing. Black Christmas was one of Bing Crosby's lesser-known hits, although something tells me he didn't do the soundtrack. You know, normally I think carolers are just annoying, but this movie actually managed to make them creepy, too. Ooh, and I see the screenplay was written by Topical 2017 Political Reference. The movie's directed by Bob Clark, who's also famous for directing A Christmas Story. Although, sadly, TBS never made airing this movie for 24 hours straight a Christmas tradition. In my opinion, though, they totally should have. Anyway, the movie opens on a sorority house. I can't imagine a slasher movie taking place there. But is this movie really as influential as they say? Unbelievable. Can you believe this Canadian movie is ripping off Friday the 13th? And several years before that movie, too! This guy actually just wants to use the sorority house's phone, but because he's Canadian, he's too polite to impose and just decides to break in instead. It'll be less awkward that way. Well, looks like we got a pretty happening party going on here. We've got Lois Lane, Juliet, Edith Prickley, and, um, Gene Shalit? Alright, I guess that's one way to make sure he gave the movie a good review. This Christmas story is about a Santa who comes to slay some co-eds and turn them into Christmas spirits. Meanwhile, Margot is no kidder with her terrific performance. You know, some people didn't like that the last Resident Evil game was first person, but it looks pretty creepy to me. And here's one sign it's Christmas. It's only 7 o'clock and Margot Kidder already looks hammered. And nothing says Christmas like prank calls. Let me lick it. Lick it. Lick it. Let me like your pretty piggy cunt. Piggy cunt, you want my fat cock. Man, the Jerky Boys early stuff was dark. You fucking creep! I'm going to kill you. What's really scary is it's the 70s and he's calling them collect. This is gonna cost him a fortune. Also, they don't seem to think this is a very big deal. I really don't think you should provoke somebody like that, Barb. Oh, listen, this guy's minor league in the city. I get two of those a day. Really? Because you should probably tell the police then. You really are too much, Barb. 
Oh, come on. This is a sorority house, not a convent. Is it a sorority house for 35-year-olds? The killer seems to be taking his time. Good thing he saran-wrapped himself so he doesn't spoil. And once again, slasher movies totally didn't exist before Halloween. Claude? Is that you, Puss? Who is that? It's not your cat. Run! Who is it? <laughs> Hmm, okay, not quite a Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2 level jump scare, but still, pretty good. Okay, I gotta ask again, what is the average age of this sorority house? Oh, wait, I guess that's the house mother. Uh, can we go back to the killer, please? Fun fact, in the 70s, whiskey counted as both a mouthwash and a valid excuse for hitting your wife. But wait a second, what about that girl that got attacked earlier? Man, people went to weird lengths to get an orgasm in the 70s. Oh, and here's one difference between a good slasher movie and a bad one. We never actually see this entire kill, yet the reveal of the aftermath is a million times more haunting than any of Sorority House Massacre's generic stabby-stab kills. By the way, kids, did you know Gene Shalit was the original Bad Santa? Ho, 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 shit. Okay, between this and A Christmas Story, does anybody else get the feeling Bob Clark had a bad experience with a mall Santa when he was a kid? Ho, ho, ho. In the 70s, not only was it appropriate to swear around children, but even Grandma could tell you to go fuck yourself. The sorority house gets a visit from the father of Claire, the girl that was murdered earlier, and he doesn't seem too happy with the house mother. I'm very disappointed in this atmosphere. Yeah, you're telling me. That wallpaper is atrocious. I didn't send my daughter here to be drinking and picking up boys. Really? You're surprised that kind of thing's going on in a sorority house? It's like going to a frat house and being surprised there's homoerotic hazing rituals. Claire's father is concerned that he hasn't been able to contact his daughter, although personally I'd be more concerned that she's in a sorority with this as a house mother. Eh, would you fuck me? I'd fuck me. I'd fuck me so hot. Eh. And why is everybody in this house so concerned with finding that damn cat? Here, kitty! Oh, God damn it, Claude, you little prick! Oh, uh, please tell me these two aren't about to fuck. Well, nothing seems to be amiss on this normal Canadian July afternoon. It, oh, right. <laughs> Somebody got murdered. Anyway, Jess, another one of the sorority sisters, played by Olivia Hussey, goes to tell her boyfriend Peter that she's pregnant. But that's not the only big news. I'm gonna have an abortion. You can't make a decision like that. You haven't even asked me. Actually, she can. One year after Roe v. Wade, bitch. Peter doesn't seem too happy with Claire wanting an abortion. And between this movie and Twitch of the Death Nerve, what is it with proto-slasher movies and guys in turtleneck sweaters? Meanwhile, it looks like Margot Kidder's busy finishing her breakfast. Hey, a sailor, what's a handsome guy like you doing here? Say, if you're not doing anything later, you should pop on over to my room. And I still don't know about this sorority's attitude towards obscene phone calls. What your mother and I must know is... You've got the wrong number. Where did you put Agnes, Billy? Billy? Look, I'm telling you, you have the wrong number. Okay, I'm just gonna give you a bit of advice. If you get a call from a stranger and they start saying things like, I'm going to kill you and I want to lick your piggy cunt, instead of saying that they might have the wrong number, HANG UP! Claire's dad and her sorority sisters go to the police to say she's gone missing. I guess they didn't bother checking every room in the house. Although, I don't know if the information they give is going to be very helpful. Could you give me the number at the sorority house? It's, uh... Fellatio 20880. Fellatio. It's a, it's a new exchange. F-E. So, uh, can anybody visit this sorority house? You know, if I didn't know any better, I'd think this movie might be Canadian. Turns out Jason Voorhees isn't the only guy in a slasher movie that wears a hockey mask. Jess tells Claire's boyfriend she's gone missing, but not to worry, Lieutenant John Saxon is on the case. If he can investigate the Freddy Krueger murders, I'm pretty sure he can solve this mystery. And despite the flag on his desk, something tells me this isn't the United States. You stupid son of a bitch, you got a big goddamn mouth! I want to know why nothing's being done about Claire Harrison. You're a friend of Claire Harrison? Yeah, I've been taking her out. I mean, we've searched for her all over the house, under the couch. We can't figure out what this is all about. 
Still though, it's good that they let us know that this is totes America, yo, because if this didn't take place in the United States, it would have literally no impact on the rest of the movie. And did somebody say 70 Snapple facts? There's a certain species of turtle that can screw for three days without stopping. Well, yeah, but I mean, considering it's at a rate of like one pump a minute, that's not that impressive. Barb, you're drunk. Yes, Barb is awake. Good observation, Andrea. Meanwhile, Peter doesn't seem to be taking Jess's decision to get an abortion well. Hmm, well, not really my thing, but Pitchfork gave it an 8.5. Anyway, the police begin to search for Claire in a nearby park, although again, they should probably check every room in the sorority house first. So the first thing we'll do is call the park. Check the attic! The worst part about this is, due to the harsh Canadian winter, it's gonna be months before the smell gives her away. At least the house mother finally decides to check the attic, although it's only because she thinks she hears that damn cat again. Claude! Claude? Listen, lady, the cat's not the one you hear breathing heavily and masturbating right now. Trust me. While a lot of slasher movies have people getting killed while having sex, this movie has people getting killed while looking for pussy. The police find a body in the park, but as we all know, it's not actually Claire, but another girl. So I guess one upside to Claire getting killed is it helped the cops find out about this other murder. And why do you keep taking these phone calls? <laughs> Look, best case scenario, he's masturbating over the phone. Just hang up. Yes, hello? Um, I've been getting obscene phone calls, and I want to know what can be done about it. <gasps> okay, so even this movie isn't above a fake-out scare. But considering it waited until halfway through to do one, and there wasn't a loud, obnoxious music sting when it happened, I'll let it slide. Peter may be all artsy-fartsy now, but eventually he'll cut his hair and join the space program. Before then, though, he might want to work on his communication skills. I'm quitting the conservatory and we're getting married. We'll say something. Okay, least romantic proposal ever! You didn't even get me a ring, you cheap bastard! Needless to say, Jess isn't too psyched about this. Peter, I don't want to marry you. All right. What about the baby? I say we split him in half biblical style. That way everybody wins. Or just freak out and make people think you're the killer. That works too, I guess. You selfish bitch. You're talking about killing our babies as though you were having a wart removed. You are not going to abort that baby. Dude, you don't understand. If she doesn't get an abortion, this'll turn into another 70s Canadian horror movie. Soon after, the police come by to see if they can figure out the source of the phone calls the house has been getting. I would like to put a tap on your phone, but we'll need your written permission to do that if it's okay with you. Ah, remember when organizations actually had to ask permission to put you under surveillance? The cops also leave a man to watch the house, but the turtleneck does not look pleased about this. And put a coat on, it's cold out, stupid! I can just feel it. Oh, come on now, Phil. We don't know that. <laughs> Poor Mr. Harrison. Ah, oh, what? You mean Andrea Martin can do comedic and dramatic roles? You make me laugh right now. The killer may still be in the attic, but at least the plastic is helping to keep his victim fresh. While Jess waits for a phone call, looks like Barb has passed out. Uh, I mean, fallen asleep. But uh-oh. <laughs> I guess I had a, a nightmare. I dreamt that I was sober. And listen, Jess, you've got enough to worry about. You don't need the children of the damned caroling outside your door. Back in the 70s, first-person slashers were often blamed for corrupting the youth of America. Well, that and marijuana. And here's a tip. If you want to survive a horror movie, make sure none of your decorations can also double as murder weapons. <laughs> Okay, now I'll never be able to hear that song the same way again. But if it makes you feel any better, Barb was so hammered when this happened, she didn't feel a thing. Jess gets another call from the killer, who gives her a little clue. Just like having a wart removed! Oh my god! 
Holy shit, I think Marty might be the killer. Wait. Unfortunately, they weren't able to trace the call. If it wasn't enough time, you'll have to keep them on the line longer. It's 1974. The calls need to be at least three hours long in order for us to trace them. I don't know if Peter is the killer, but even if he isn't, he is still kind of a creep. Was Peter with you any of the times that you got one of these calls? Yes, he was here. He was at the house tonight when the first call came. That's right, it couldn't be Peter. Oh, well, what do you know? Turns out he was just a red herring in a green turtleneck. I knew it couldn't have been Peter. I mean, I always pegged him as a potential date rapist, but a killer? Nah. Despite the evidence to the contrary, Lieutenant Fuller goes to try and find Peter, and for people who say horror movies have no artistry or craft to them, cinematographer Reginald Morris says you can kiss his ass. And sorry, Andrea Martin, not only are you not final girl material, but we're not even going to show how you get killed. Meanwhile, Jess gets another call from the killer. <laughs> twist is that this is all just a prank played by the local radio station. Congratulations, Jess. You just won Doobie Brothers tickets. All right, the real twist is this. The caller is in the house. The calls are coming from the house. Okay, so the movie uses the whole the call is coming from inside the house trope, but it's important to remember this was made in 1974. This wasn't a common thing in horror movies yet. There is a big difference between a movie blindly using a cliché just because it's popular and helping to invent it in the first place. Okay, so the killer's inside the house, but as long as Jess quickly goes out the door and lets the police handle things, she should be okay. Oh, what the hell are you doing? Maybe Jess figures now that she's the final girl, she's guaranteed to survive. That doesn't make this part any less terrifying. Thanks. Run, bitch! Oh, what the hell? You mean the sorority locks from the outside? Who the hell's idea was that? Jess tries hiding from the killer in the basement, because those are always safe places in horror movies, right? This climax is definitely tense, but once again, it's important to remember that slasher movies didn't exist before Halloween. The police make their way to the house, but I think they might be a little late since it looks like Jess is being stalked by more moody cinematography. Oh, wait, it's just Peter. Well, we may have already established that Peter's probably not the killer, but he is kind of a creep, so better kill him just to be safe. Listen, I appreciate you coming over, fellas, but there's no need to worry, I already took care of things. That's what Peter gets for saying I couldn't get an abortion. My body, my choice, motherfucker. I knew it. I knew it in my gut it was that kid. Okay, if by kid you mean 38-year-old. Alright, well, looks like this about wraps things up. But wait a second, didn't they say earlier Peter wasn't the killer? Ugh, I don't like how ominously the camera's moving right now. Agnes, it's me, Billy. Now, if you're worried I'm gonna spoil the big twist of who the killer is, don't worry, I'm not gonna do that. Mainly because... The movie doesn't. Yeah, the movie ends without ever revealing the identity of the killer. Other than what his eyeball looks like and that his name is apparently Billy, we have no idea who he is or why he's doing the things he's doing. Although, given that it was directed by Bob Clark, I like to think this movie is about what happened when Ralphie from A Christmas Story went insane and became a serial killer when he grew up. Black Christmas was a box office success when it was first released, making more than six times its budget back, but, like a lot of horror movies at the time, it only received mixed reviews from critics, with Variety calling it a bloody, senseless, kill-for-kicks feature. Boy, if only they had marketed this movie as a psychological thriller, then critics would have liked it. Since then, though, the movie's reception has been much more positive, with many now considering it a horror movie classic, and it also made it to number 87 on Bravo's list of 100 scariest movie moments. But does Black Christmas really deserve all that acclaim? Yeah, it does. 
I mentioned at the beginning that you can't really point to any one movie as inventing the slasher genre, but this movie really helped to cement a lot of the conventions that we now take for granted. The ominous POV shots, the creepy phone calls, the fact that it takes place on a normally joyous holiday, all those elements are in here, yet it still doesn't come across as especially cliched even more than 40 years later. But even ignoring how influential this was to later slasher movies, taken on its own terms, this is an exceptionally well-crafted movie, with the camera camera work, lighting, performances, and sound design all contributing to the creepy atmosphere. It's also not an especially gory film, yet it never feels like it's pulling its punches, which is critical to making an effective horror movie. Some people may consider the fact that we never find out who the killer is to be a cop-out, but this is another element that helps it stand out from other horror movies. The fact that he keeps mentioning someone named Agnes in a past horrific event hints at a larger story, but we never truly know what it is, and personally, I find that a lot more interesting and scary than if the movie just spelled everything out for us. And as some sequels to horror movies have taught us, sometimes you don't want to know everything about a horror movie killer. While Black Christmas may not quite be as famous, along with other films of the time like The Exorcist and The Texas Chainsaw Massacre, this helped to shape horror movies as we know them today. And for that, Black Christmas deserves to be considered both a horror and Christmas classic. Merry Christmas, everybody! Well, that's all for now, and that's all for 2017. After making over 50 episodes this year, I think I'm going to take a little break, eat some turkey, and drink some rum and eggnog. And by that I mean just rum, because eggnog is fucking gross. See you in 2018, everybody! They did three days, 24 hours a day. Boom, 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 boom.